Thank you for coming to my presentation tonight. I'm Peter Wiley. I'm a staff psychologist here in the ADHD program for the last 15 years. And uh, then I um, uh, worked in private practice for 12 years before that. I've specialized in ADHD for uh, 25 to 30 years. So I will uh, hope to share some of my alleged wisdom with you tonight on um, uh, one of the hot topics in ADHD called executive functioning. Um, let me announce, uh, as I am required to do, I have no financial conflicts of interest with anyone, so when I recommend a couple of books, it's only because I think they're good, not because I'm getting a cut. All right, I will talk about uh, kids I've worked with through the years, but confidentiality is very important. So I want you to know uh, all the kids I'll talk about were uh, in another job I had in another state. So if you think, gee, I think I might know that kid, I'm sure you do not. Everything is confidential. Now, the main child we are going to be talking about tonight is one with the combined type of ADHD. That is inattentiveness and hyperactivity impulsivity. If you have a child who only has the inattentive type, I'm sure there'll be a lot of things that uh, will be helpful to you tonight. But most kids with ADHD uh, are the combined type and that is the um, child we're talking about tonight. In addition, Whenever there's a book or presentation on ADHD, we only talk about kids who really have the disorder rather severely. I'm pretty sure there will, in all of history, never be a book or a presentation called Really Mild ADHD. Okay, so as I, I, I go over this stuff, if you think, ah, oh, come on, my kid functions higher than that, I'm sure you're right. It'll just be easier for you to do this stuff than if you have a more severe case uh, to deal with. Finally, questions. I want to have a lot of questions, but rather than just jump in uh, at three different times, I'll explain executive functioning. I'll explain how ADHD makes executive functioning difficult. And then we'll do a lot of practical application. So we'll stop at those three points to take questions. What is executive functioning? This word is thrown around a lot. As a professional, I don't always know what people are talking about, and I'll give you an example of why. In a big 1994 conference at the National Institute of Child uh, Health and Development, uh, in a conference on executive functioning, 10 experts were asked to nominate what they think the symptoms of executive functioning are, and only six skills out of the 33 could even get 40% approval. Self-regulation, sequencing, flexibility, response inhibition, which is stopping before you act, planning, and organization. So there is a tremendous amount of disagreement about what exactly should be included in executive functioning. So let's look at some uh, famous definitions. Uh, the great philosopher John Dewey said it's acting with purpose. An expert in ADHD named Russell Barkley called it the alteration of the probability of future events to our advantage. Martha Denkla, a great neuropsychologist, called it getting your act together. Paul Esslinger uh, said, to know where you're going, you have to know where you are and where you've been. So memory is what you use to look at the past. Attention is what you look at the present. And executive functioning is what you use to try to plan the future. And at the risk of being narcissistic, my own definition is freedom from the tyranny of impulsive behavior. So Denkla came up with a very famous four-component definition of executive functioning, which acronym is the Egyptian goddess Isis. Initiate, sustain, inhibit, 
and shift. The only thing I have uh, problems with these kind of definitions, all right, first you start doing a behavior, then you keep doing it, or you stop doing it, or you shift to some other behavior. That's everything, all right? So we want it to get more defined so as a psychologist, I can help you with your child's problems. So the two things that I think are absolutely crucial. These are just the two bottom lines of executive functioning. Inhibition. The initial executive act must be the inhibition and delay of an impulsive response. That is, you can't, if your ball rolls into the street when you're a little child, you can't just go with your first impulse to get the ball. The first thing you gotta do to run your life correctly is to not give in to your first impulse. And as we talk about ADHD, we will see that that is simply one of the core problems of children who have ADHD. And then you must use your working memory. A fancy way to talk about that is the prolongation of events in memory so they can be retained and analyzed online, compared with past events, and used to plan the future. I think the best way to think about it is talking to yourself inside your head. For those of us who just do that all the time, we think it's just natural. I'm telling you, ADHD kids do not tend to stop and talk inside their head. So what does this all mean, bottom line, in regular English? You got to stop and think. That is the essence of executive functioning. You have to stop that initial impulse to do the easy thing the thing that just is what you want to do right off the bat, and you have to talk to yourself inside your head, what would be a better way to approach this that'll pay off for me in the long run? And I mean, we're doing this every single day. I don't know how the parking was when you came here today, but it might have occurred to you, I'll just park illegally, see if I get lucky. There's a strategy may not pay off very well. I'll go around the block looking for a ramp. I don't know what strategy you picked, but the first one of, hey, there's an opening next to the curb, I don't care if it's legal or not, is probably not the best strategy you might have picked. All right, so stop and think is what we want our children to do, and that's gonna be difficult for kids with ADHD. All right, so now let's try to operationalize this. And there is a checklist that I give to parents, can also give to teachers, called the brief, the behavior rating inventory of executive functioning. And the eight things that this uh, checklist looks for, to me, pretty much captures all we got to know about executive functioning. So it's as good an operational definition as we need. There's inhibit, that first one under behavioral regulation. Can you stop and think before you act? Now skip, skip shift for a moment and go to emotional control. So here I am, I'm a little kid in the toy store and I ask my parent for the $150 Lego set. He or she says no. Can I stay cool? or am I going to throw a tantrum? Do I have sufficient emotional control to keep it together and now go back up to shift? How about the $60 Lego set? It's a strategy. That's good executive functioning by a kid. All right, I'm not getting everything I want, but rather than just humiliate my parent in public as a result, how about if I go for something cheaper? It's behavioral regulation, metacognition, initiate. We'll get to this soon. You got to get off your butt and start. ADHD people procrastinate more than the average person. There's working memory that we talked about. 
plan and organize uh, is pretty uh, self-obvious. Um, Organization of materials, do you lose everything? Are you incredibly sloppy? Do you, do you know where your ruler is? And then monitoring is, okay, am I gonna go back and check my work? Am I keeping track of whether my handwriting is getting sloppier as I get um, more exhausted here? So if we look at those eight things, I got this checklist, I get the information back, it gives me a good idea of exactly what I have to help this family with in regard to executive functioning. And all this stuff will, will become clearer as we keep uh, working. So we're not gonna, this is for when I, I work with professionals to explain the brief. Developmental considerations. Executive functioning, believe it or not, starts at nine months when babies start to try to figure out the world to their advantage. If I lift that up, I find the thing that my parent just covered. When I started 30 years ago, they said executive functioning was done at 21. Your brain was mature, that's it. And they said 25, then they said 30, and now we're into the claim is that you are not fully mature at executive functioning until your early 30s. Boy, that's a long time to wait for full self-control. Executive functioning is based to a great extent on the maturation of the frontal lobe. We feel this is the executive, this is the conductor of the orchestra, this is the general of the army, but it's never that simple. There's lots of connections to other parts of the brain. Unquestionably, the frontal lobe is the last part of the brain to fully mature. This is why you can have a teenager who's got 140 IQ and just does startlingly dumb things. How could you do that? I don't know. Okay, ADHD is a developmental disability in which a child's neurological constitution causes problems in the area of sustained attention, modulation of arousal, that is hyperactivity and emotional ability, and the inhibition of impulsive behavior. I will ask you to change three to five percent of the population to five to seven percent. I need to update my slide and I forgot to do it. Uh, it is controversial, but the incidence of children and adults diagnosed with ADHD is going up. Some people think this is good because we are catching more kids and we are uh, making the diagnosis properly. Others think that it is overdiagnosed. We will not get into that tonight, but five to 7% uh, is I think more current and two and a half to three times more boys than girls. It was once thought that it was somewhere between six to 10 times more boys than girls, but then we figured out that Bart Simpson causes more trouble than the average ADHD girl, therefore he gets referred to people like me, and that's why we thought there were that many more boys than girls. Unquestionably, there's more boys than girls, but not uh, it, it, the idea, oh, it's, it's a problem for just boys is absolutely not true. Let's start with poor sustained attention. After all, it's called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And a very strongly now, if you don't remember too many things I say tonight, remember this one. I want to attack the inaccurate term short attention span. I bet your child does not have a short attention span for the things that he most loves to do. These kids were born to play video games, well, it's Legos, baseball, whatever it is that they love, they can pay attention. They often hyper-focus on those things. 
So let me change that to something that is much more to the point. Short attention span really means an inability to sustain concentration, effort, and motivation in a subjectively boring task. It's not short attention span, it's an inability to power through your boredom. And that's very different. It's just very different. I wish I had a nickel for every time I talked to a teacher who said, come on Wiley, don't tell me he's got ADHD. He has no trouble paying attention during gym. He has no trouble paying attention during dinosaurs. He has no maybe math, maybe science. But then I ask him to write a 50 word essay and he's on the floor and he's whimpering and just, that's what it is. So two things are very important here. Kid, you got to get through school and find a job that you really like. Because I cannot protect you from boredom in school. You will be ordered to be a mathematician, a historian, a writer, a scientist, an actor, a musician, an athlete. I don't think you're going to like all of them. And you have to learn to power through your boredom. Number two, we have to use secondary reinforcers. Billy, if you hate to read, give me 30 minutes of reading and you can earn the following privileges. I will defend rewards in a few minutes. We have to help them power through their boredom. Let me tell you a story that was pivotal in, in my uh, career. Uh, family came to me, 18-year-old uh, boy, had just broken their heart. Despite his 130 IQ, he had announced he wasn't going to college. In telling this story, I am not predicting that your kid won't go to college, okay? So uh, they said, uh, Dr. Wiley, make him go to college. I said, you really don't understand how counseling works, but let me talk to him. So he comes in and um, I said, uh, Jim, is it true you're not going to college? He said, yeah. I know my parents are very upset about it. And I said, why? And he had ADHD. I said, why, Jim? He said, Dr. Wiley, can you tell me the most boring experience you've ever had? I said, you know, I can give you an immediate answer to that. I was working at the Bethlehem Steel Plant in Lackawanna, New York to pay for college. and. The college guys, since it took 90 days to get into the union, were the only people who didn't have union protection. We had these little white helmets while all the union guys had brown helmets. So it was night shift, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., and there were no orders for steel that night. Nothing. So the union guys said, hey, we don't look busy and they all laid out on the benches and went to sleep. The foreman was enraged. He had one person he could take it out on. He said, Wiley, come with me. He took me to a dirt floor, gave me a broom, and told me to sweep it. I said, sir, you don't seem to understand. The purpose of sweeping is to remove a thin film of dirt from a floor that is not actually made out of dirt. This is purposely. He said, if I f see you taking one rest, you're fired. So for eight hours from 11 p.m. except for lunch break uh, to 7 a.m., I pushed a broom back while I'd see his beady little eyes looking at me from behind piles of steel for a chance to fire me. I thought that night would never end. So now back to the session, and the kid looks at me and said, very colorful story, Dr. Wiley. That's how I feel every day in school. You people who don't have ADHD think our sense of boredom is a little more than yours. You know that a depressed person is not just a little more than sad. You know a person with panic attacks is not just a little more than nervous. But you think we're a little more bored than you are. I am here to tell you I find school to be so crushingly boring. And I'm not volunteering for four more years of this. 
The only thing I can pay attention to is my rock and roll guitar and I can practice it for six hours a day. I'm not an idiot. I probably will not get rich and famous, but it's what I can do. It's what I love and so I can pay attention. Finally, I got it. I want you to understand your child feels boredom differently. Because have you said this a million times? Jimmy, just get your homework over with and then you can play for the rest of the evening. You're the one who's dragging it out. But he doesn't want to face it because to him it's more boring than it is to us. Okay? Off-task behavior, distractibility. I want to try to cut off here a really common sense intervention. About third, fourth grade. We'll buy her a desk, we'll put it in her bedroom, we'll shut the door, that'll cut off all the distractions. And when we get back, all her homework will be done because there was nothing there. As soon as you shut the door, just, they will immediately go off task. So even though the kitchen table, the dining room table, does have a lot of distractions, your human presence to support the child is there. A lot of nice teachers have a study carol, a desk with three blinders on it. A kid just uses it to hide while he's pushing his pencil around and pretending it's a train. Human support works better than isolation. Superficial concentration. Uh, how many kids have I tested who I'm told he has terrible reading comprehension? I do a reading comprehension test. I said, Tommy, please pay attention for 15 crummy minutes and really do your best. They have good reading comprehension, but for homework, they run their eyes over the words mindlessly. Oh yeah, I'm done. And now they have to answer the 10 questions at the end. Mom, the answer is not in here. It is not in here. You find it for me, and if you're in a snotty mood, you just say, well, if it's not in there, it wouldn't do me any good to look either. He knows it's in there. He didn't want to read it the first time. He sure as heck doesn't want to read it the second time. I will show you tonight a way to help your kid read those chapters so it pays off. Procrastination. Yes, all human beings procrastinate, but ADHD people tend to do it more. And now I think you understand it is the soul-crushing sense of boredom. So I've asked this question of so many kids I've worked with. Why do you leave your projects to the night before? And they always say, oh no. And I said, is it something like this? Three weeks to do the project. Three weeks, I can't power through my boredom. Two weeks, I still can't power through my boredom. One week, I still can't power through my boredom. It's due tomorrow. I'm panicking. I'm hysterical. I'm going to get a zero. It finally energized me enough to power through my boredom. And it's a terrible strategy. You hate it. The kid is hysterical. And the projects aren't that good. But they can't face it before the guillotine is about to come down and chop their head off. We'll work on projects today, too. Poor working memory. I told you this is one of the, the key things. We have to talk to ourselves inside our heads to do things, OK? This is what I do when I get up in the morning. I turn the alarm clock off. I urinate. I wash my face. I shave. I comb my hair. I dress, I get it. I don't think I'm doing anything. And yet I must be talking inside my head to go through those steps. If you are that kind of person who doesn't have ADHD, you don't realize you're doing anything. But I, I was working with uh, one family uh, and mom put it, why do I have to tell him to brush his teeth? twice every day. He brushed his teeth 730 times when he was nine, 730 times when he was eight. This is at least 5,000 times, and yet 
every morning and every evening, it doesn't come to mind. So now go to that last one and then we'll come back to sense of time. I call this lack of mindfulness. Much better term than forgetful. Right? I really have forgotten who the 13th president of the United States is. I, mean, I could sit here all night. I don't know. But everyone knows that our income tax is due on April 15th. Yeah, come on, it's in there. Everyone knows the mortgage is due the first of the month. When I used to work with ADHD adults, constantly they forgot that stuff. It isn't that it wasn't in there, but it didn't come to mind when they needed it. This one guy loved his wife, married seven years. He forgot her anniversary seven times, forgot her birthday seven times. So the wife was not pleased, and he said, she says that I'm thoughtless. He said, you know, if by that she means I don't love her, she's wrong. But if she literally means I am thoughtless, what defense do I have? It's a hard way to go through life. Hard on the parent, hard on the teacher, hard on the kid. How many ADHD kids just tell me, and adults, I'm a screw up. I'm just always in trouble. I'm always told I'm irresponsible. And they've got a point. I don't do the stuff I'm supposed to do because it doesn't come to mind when they need it. I'm obsessive. Stuff comes to mind that I don't want to come to mind. I can't forget stuff. Uh, I don't know how you go through life like that. I was working with a young woman and I said, all right, good first session. And we made a second session. I gave her the card. She said, I don't need a card. I said, please take the card. She said, I don't need the card. Humor me, please take the card. <laughs> so we had a unisex bathroom. A couple hours later, I go to use the bathroom. In the wastebasket is her card. She forgot to come to her next session. So when we rescheduled, I just said, I wasn't trying to humiliate you. I give everyone a card. She said, Dr. Wiley, I'm sorry, but so many people have treated me like an idiot because I can't remember anything. And the reason it gets me so upset is, and then she started crying, they're right. And I said, they are not right. You have ADHD, and we're going to work on it. You are not an idiot, but you have lack of mindfulness. OK? Poor sense of time. Come on, the bus is going to be here. Come on. And now remember, this, a lot of that's just kids. But I mean, ADHD, and they just, uh, and we've done experiments. You know, for, say, do math problems for this long, and it's three minutes. You ask a kid without ADHD, about how long did you do math? And they'll say two minutes, four minutes, three minutes. ADHD kids, oh, 45 seconds, eight minutes and 30, you know, the very poor sense of time. Next, poor modulation of arousal. Hyperactivity, the most famous symptom, right? This used to be called hyperactivity. I am telling you that if you could do the slide I just showed you on paying attention, powering through your boredom, and having mindfulness, and could do the one I'm going to show you next, unquestionably, hyperactivity is the most trivial symptom. If I did this uh, presentation and uh, I was just real fidgety, but I was on task, yeah, it might drive you crazy in some sense. But okay, if the kid wiggles but did what he's supposed to do, hyperactivity, even though it is the most visible symptom and the most famous symptom, is really not very important. 75% of boys are called hyperactive by somebody during their childhood. 
I was not hyperactive. Many a dinner, I would stand up, walk around the dinner table twice, and then sit back down. My mother said, what are you doing? I don't know. I can't sit this long. And I definitely didn't have ADHD. It's not that important. Tell you a story. First grade, Catholic school. The good sister says, children, your invisible guardian angel is sitting next to you on your chair, and if you wiggle too much, you will knock her off and kill her. <laughs> so as I think of my buddies who had ADHD, I mean, one of my hobbies is thinking back through my life and figuring out what people had. Um, they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. Peter, I think I killed my guardian angel. <laughs> All right, emotional liability. This is the only controversial thing I'm gonna to say tonight. I am convinced that this is part of ADHD and should not be looked at as a separate emotional problem. They got less control of their ability to uh, power through their boredom. They got less control of their impulses. They got less control of their hyperactivity. Why shouldn't they have less control? of their emotions. So certainly not all, but a substantial percentage of ADHD kids have really hot temper. And when you frustrate their immediate gratification, they get really angry. And boy, I've worked on thousands and thousands of tantrums in my career. It's, it's tough. You got to set limits. You can't let the kid do whatever he wants. But boy, do you get pushback from some ADHD kids. Not all. Crying at the drop of a hat. And overexcitability. You go to a birthday party. It's Christmas morning. They just are a runaway berserk. Half the toys are broken by noon on Christmas morning. Uh, kid demands that uh, he gets to try to break the pinata at first. No, the birthday boy gets, to, and it's, it's just, it's sad, all right? Out of control emotionally, those are the ADHD kids who are really challenging. Some people say, no, the parent must have made them angry. I don't believe that. I just don't believe it. It's part of ADHD. Okay, poor inhibition. Once again, this is one of the two big ones, inhibition and working memory in executive functioning. This didn't make the cut to be in the name, right? Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's only 17 syllables. I'm kind of glad they didn't make it longer. But I am telling you that if you have the combined type of ADHD kid as opposed to the inattentive only, if your child is impulsive, Unquestionably, this is the most severe symptom. You act before you think rather than you think before you act. And this is a very vulnerable way to go through life. In order to live successfully, we must simultaneously live in the present, the past, and the future. By that I mean, I'm a little kid playing in my front yard and my ball rolls into the street present. I have an impulse to get my ball. I must now live in the past. What is the rule my parents have taught me about entering the street? Well, if I'm a little kid, I can't enter at all. If I'm an older kid and it's a side street, I am allowed to carefully look both ways and enter the street. I must live in the future. What could happen if I run into, <gasps> I could get hit by a car. Ah, oh, come on, will you tell me a six-year-old kid is thinking, yes, why does anyone stop at the edge of the road except you remember you're supposed to and you're worried you're going to get run over? This six-year-old runs into the street without looking, gets his ball, thank God no car was coming. Mother runs out of the front door hysterically saying, Joey, what is the rule about entering the street? I'm not supposed to. Then you know, but it didn't come to mind when he needed it. The lack of mindfulness keeps him from being rule governed and consequence governed. Instead, they're just impulse governed. Uh, yeah, just wait till the end of the impulse and then we'll take questions. This is huge. 
It's just huge. Your job is to teach your child self-control because they are not good at it. They have a desire for immediate gratification. Just the way these kids are wired, easy short-term goals are what they go for rather than long-term difficult goals. I was an obsessive kid. I'd like to blow my homework off and go and play kickball with the guys, but this zero will show up on my report card 10 weeks from now. That is not how an ADHD kid thinks. Now, deal with that later. I want to play kickball now. Recklessness. From what I've just described, are we surprised that uh, they have three times more emergency room uh, trips than the average kid? Teenage drivers have three times more speeding tickets and three times more auto accidents. It's working with the kid who jumped off the roof. It was a Cape Cod, 10 feet, broke his leg. I said, Billy, please don't just shrug your shoulders and say, I don't know. What went through your head just before you jumped off the roof? He said, I don't know. I said, did the thought, I might get hurt, go through your mind? He said, come on, you know me, Dr. Wiley. No. He said, the best I can tell you is it would be really cool to jump off the roof. Now, I'm, I'm, I was a boy, I was a kid. My grandfather took me up on the garage roof, so that's a one-story building, to help him re-shingle. He said, let's take a break. I went to the edge of the roof, very thick, lush grass, it's 10 feet, thinking, man, it would be really cool. And I imagined my ankles compressing into sawdust and being taken to the hospital in an ambulance and I didn't jump off the roof. I stopped and thought, even though I was a stupid little boy. Low frustration tolerance. I love music. I am grateful I played the trombone poorly in school. Boy, if you have your kid do an instrument, you better hope that he or she really loves it because getting ADHD kids to practice for months and years before they're good at a musical instrument. Now, if a musical instrument is what they love most, that might be the thing he or she pays attention to best. Baseball, it's a tough sport. Even on offense, you're only up one-ninth of the time. The kids I work with tend to be in right field. Two hits a game, one hit out there. They're playing with crickets while what should be a single rolls past them for the game-winning home run. And poor social skills, that actually could go anywhere. 50% of kids, because they are impulsive, aren't mindful, um, violate kids' space, they just tend to have trouble making friends, about half of them. First, although tonight we are not talking about medicine, that is one treatment, what we're talking about here is you set up programs and let's say what it is is taking food, junk food from the refrigerator without permission and you set up a period of time and say if you don't do what I asked you not to do for this long, you win a certain privilege. Obviously, we can't do behavioral therapy here tonight, but the idea is to offer a secondary reinforcer that if you summon the strength of will not to give in to your impulsivity, there will be something attractive as your reward at the end. Um, and then you just keep working hard. You just keep working hard. Didn't say 100%. Son, we're sick of the drama in the morning. It is your responsibility to get ready. The only thing that has to happen is you're not naked. You must be dressed by this time. If you don't eat breakfast, you don't wash, you don't comb, you don't brush your teeth, you stink, I don't care. We're leaving then. So if it's, say, I, I'll make this up, 45 minutes. 
The most we'll do is nag you for the last five minutes, get dressed, get dressed, get dressed. And then even if your lip is bleeding because you're biting it so hard, you do absolutely nothing and he'll try it. Give it two weeks. If not, you're in the 20% where it didn't work. Well, this is just remembering what you're supposed to remember. Um, boy, I haven't meditated for a long time, but I, I was doing the one where I was trying to empty my mind. Uh, so, you know, with the ohm and all that kind of stuff. And then I've done the kind of imagining myself on the beach. This is simply, well, all right, I'll give you another one. Uh, this kid's 18. When we, you, you get a phone call for mom or dad, we have a pad, we have a pencil. These were the days where there's only one or two phones in the house, no cell phones. This is an old example. Write it down. You will not remember it, son, with ADHD. Yes, mom. Yes, dad. Dad had a soul-killing job. He hated it. He had an interview at a dream job. Mom and dad aren't home. Kid is. Hello, this is Mr. Smith of Veeble Fetzer Industries. Is, is your father there? Uh, no. Well, have your dad call me back immediately. I think he's going to be very happy. Sure. He forgets to write it down. Dad calls three days later. Mr. Smith, I'm on pins and needles. Did I get the job? Hey, if you don't bother to call for three days, I gave the job to someone else. Boy, that was a bad session. I had to practically keep dad from choking the kid. It didn't come to mind to write. That's what I'm talking about. The meditation mindfulness is something to have inner peace and stuff that's, that's different. Absolutely not. IQ has no real uh, correlation to ADHD. You got brilliant, you got average, you got below average. Their IQ scores tend to go down as the years go on simply because they weren't paying attention to learn as much stuff. But in actual intelligence, uh, it runs the gamut. Many brilliant people have ADHD. Many not so brilliant people have ADHD. Poor metacognition. The lack of mindfulness, the inability to power through boredom, we must give these kids more structure than the average child. And that structure must not be repetitive nagging. It is the poison of the families I work with. And every parent truthfully says, I don't want to nag. It's just he didn't do it the first time I told him. That's why I'm telling him the sixth time. And I'll show you specific ways to deal with that. Poor self-control. Ladies and gentlemen, if I ran the world, I would rename ADHD the combined type self-control disorder. Oh, I wish it was just short attention span and hyper. The entire stop and think system is compromised. It is self-control disorder, and that is why it is so difficult. So we must have secondary reinforcers to help the child um, be motivated to have more self-control. Finally, the leading theory of ADHD is, uh, probably you know, is that it is the neurological constitution of the child. It is not a disease. It's a disorder. So a powerful treatment is medication, but that is not the topic we are talking about tonight. All right, so let's, let's start with school, executive functioning in school. I think it's harder nowadays than when I went to school. There is more homework than when I was a kid, more long-term projects. You know, it's kind of hard to talk against long-term projects, but when I was a boy, we had to memorize the planets, and we had a picture. There's the sun, there's Mercury, and Mercury, Venus, Earth. Now you got to make a diorama of the solar system. And the sun's a basketball, and the Mercury's a golf ball. And you know the poor parents have to do this. The kid couldn't possibly pull this off. And supposedly, then you memorize the planets. But I don't know. Is it worth it? 
I wonder, but hey, I don't run the world. More scheduled activities. I don't know how you modern parents do it, schlepping your kid to all this stuff, but you know that's just how life is now. Travel teams, unheard of when I was a kid, unheard of. We went down a mile for Little League Baseball. We didn't go to New York City, but that's your life. And more competing temptations. Yeah, I had television and radio. The smartphones, oh my God. How many kids take their smartphone, cover themselves in their covers, and text all night about nothing? Here we go. The most important principle that I want you to internalize before you leave here today, both the parent and the teacher must accept that they have to function as the child's frontal lobe for much longer than they wish. Slowly, they can withdraw their support as the child's executive functioning improves at a much later date than the parent and teacher wish. I have nothing to offer you but blood, sweat, toil, and tears. Famous guy Russell Barkley, he said, this isn't really a literature review, but think of ADHD kids' executive functioning as being 30% behind. A 10-year-old has the executive functioning of a 7-year-old without ADHD. And we give them car keys at 16 when they have the executive functioning of an 11-year-old. Right? Not every kid's the same. Your kid may be doing better than that, uh, but uh, you can't just say, buckle uh, up, get serious, uh, write your homework down, and that's just going to get it done. Talk psychotherapy does not work with ADHD kids. But, I don't want to be too pessimistic, do not overcompensate, have high expectations, and set challenging goals for your kids in regard to tasks that require executive functioning, homework, musical instrument, feeding a pet. Sometimes they'll do just fine, but if they don't, after a reasonably short amount of time, do something else. If you have yelled at your kid several hundred times about something, it ain't going to work if you do it several hundred more times. If you tell him, write your homework down, and for months he hasn't written his homework down, telling him to write his homework down is not going to work. But it worked with my other kid who doesn't have ADA. I believe you. you got to increase structure. When I work with parents in therapy, I said, you are going to become environmental engineers who set up your child's life for maximum success. You are going to manipulate reminders, rewards, all this stuff to um, help him remember what he's supposed to do, but nagging is what we don't want to do because it doesn't work. By definition, nagging means you're saying it more than once, so that proves it didn't work. And we have to increase rewards or reluctantly punishments, make rewards more powerful, more frequent, or go in small steps. I was working with a kid who was out of a seat ten times a day in first grade. I called the teacher, said let's set up a behavioral program. And she said, great, if he doesn't get out of his seat, I'll give a happy face, he can take it home and get a prize. I said, he cannot go from 10 times a day to zero in one fell swoop. He will fail every time. Let's start at five. She said, I'm going to give him a reward for getting out of his seat five times a day. I said, no, we're going to give him a reward for getting out of his seat five fewer times a day. Then we went for four. And if you have two boys who fight a lot, if you think you're going to get it down to zero, you're dreaming. But can we get it down to something more civilized? Let's do the objections to rewards. At this age, 
He ought to be able to do that on his own without rewards or me reminding him all the time. I call this autism and it is not helpful. All right, at this age, the blind kid ought to be able to see. The deaf kid ought to be able to hear. And the ADHD kid ought to be able to write his homework down and remember to make his bed. But he's got ADHD. So just announcing what is developmentally average is useless. You shouldn't bribe a kid to do something. She should do it simply because it's the right thing to do. Good kids don't get rewards, they just do what they're told. I guess in heaven, that's how kids behave, all right? But if you're coming to me for therapy, you don't have that kid. So let's get real and do something that works rather than... But I'm now going to tell you the difference between a reward and a bribe, and this is not clever use of language, this is fundamental. A reward is thought up by the parent and is given after the work occurs. Joey, take the garbage out and that will earn you 50 cents toward your allowance. The parent thought it up and the kid gets the reward after he does the work. The parents run in the family. That's the way it's supposed to be. A bribe is thought up by the kid and is demanded before he does the work. Joey, take out the garbage. Yeah, give me 50 cents and I'll take the garbage out. No, never give in to extortion. The kid cannot run the family. This is a fundamental difference between a reward and a bribe. Rewards are good, bribes are bad, and if you absolutely reject rewards, I can't help you. That's how we influence kids' behavior. If the only reason he's doing it is that I'm giving him a reward, then he'll stop doing it as soon as I stop giving the reward. Yeah, maybe. We hope he internalizes it. But what if you got to give your kid an allowance his whole childhood? Is that the end of the world? I like working with people. I enjoy this. They stop giving me my paycheck. I ain't doing this anymore, all right? So we hope he internalizes it, but if rewards are necessary, it's better than hollering at your kid for 18 years. The bottom line of behavior modification is that you must offer a reward that is more powerful than the child's reluctance to do it. All right? I mean, this is very, very just crass, all right? Here's how much this kid doesn't want to clean his room. We will assume he knows the value of money. George, clean your room and I'll give you one cent. Well, thanks for the offer, big spender. I'd rather lose the money than do it. Now, silly example number two, George, clean your room and I'll give you $100. Of course, you're not going to do that. I think it would work. The art of behavior modification is a dime didn't work, a quarter didn't work, 50 cents worked. You're a fool to give them a dollar, okay? So try to find out what you need, but then don't over reward. I always tell people when they say, well, I'll give him a dollar a day if he does this. I say, do you realize if he's successful, that's 365 bucks a year? You always got to think these things through. But I'm telling you, if you reward a kid and they don't really want it enough, it's not going to work. So we are not bribing, but I'm going to be blunt. We are purchasing their good behavior. It's better than screaming at the kid for 18 years. It's not ideal, but it's better than nagging. Paying someone to do an activity makes them lose their inherent love for it. There are some psychologists making a lot of money on this. It's a famous study. Kindergartners, uh, okay, kids, your, your, your alphabet work is done. Now go in the back and play. And there were these wonderful watercolors. And oh, the kids flocked to it. So then the experiment was, kids, now you can play, and I will give you this little piece of candy if you do watercolors. And very quickly, they got sick of watercolors. Ah, if you reward a kid, they lose interest. But that's if you reward them for something they love. 
Why would you give your kid an allowance to play video games? You only give them rewards for the stuff they already hate. So the, even though that's true, we see it in college athletes who become pros and now become just greedy guys rather than running through the wall for their university. So we're only going to give it to them for things they hate. So that is true but irrelevant. And honestly, I, I do try to have compassion for you when you think, I don't want to give this kid rewards. What rewards do I ever get? You holier-than-thou psychologists keep telling me to give him rewards. You live with this kid for one day, and I hear you. I hear you. But you love him, and I know you're going to come through. All right, so let's do some specifics now. Unassigned pleasure reading. Research shows that both dyslexic and ADHD children do far less unassigned reading than other kids. In order to work effectively at motivating an ADHD kid to read, you must accept a fundamental principle of most of them, not all of them. They don't like to read. Get over it. You like to read. It breaks your heart that they don't like to read. I've worked with ADHD adults who told me I have never read a book in my life. I lied all the way through high school. Once I got out of high school, now no one will ever make me read a book. It's boring. On the other hand, if you have a child who loves reading, you may be able to pay attention to it fabulously. But I'll show you how motivation works. I was working with a girl, would not read, would not read. She adored Harry Potter. She demanded to be at the bookstore at midnight on Friday, you know, Saturday morning. By the end of Sunday, the 700-page book was read, and then we couldn't get her to read any other books. I have worked with so many ADHD kids who do not like to read. You must not think that just nagging them, but you should like to read, is going to work. If they find it boring, they find it boring. I never blame anyone for finding I find gardening boring. So many friends, oh, I'm sticking my fingers into God's earth. It's, oh, I'm so grounded. It's therapy. Uh, but that's me. Pay him to read. All right? George, read for this long, you get the following privilege. Not necessarily money. Saturday morning, give me 30 minutes of reading you can play. If you won't read, you don't go out to play for the rest of the day. I hate reading. But do you like to go out and play? Yeah? So here's how much he doesn't like to read. We hope he wants to go out to play at least that much. Then it'll work. If it's that much, it will not work. Depressing study. This is dyslexia, though, not ADHD. They got some very nice parents to agree to do a reading um, diary for one year. Every time your kid does reading voluntarily, the parent, the teacher didn't make them, just look at the clock, 4.02, and then look when he stops reading, 4.16, and put 14 minutes in the log. So they, at the end of the year, they compared the top 10% of good readers against the struggling uh, readers who were having trouble. And the good readers read more every two days than the poor readers read all year. 183 times more reading. So imagine that you're a good free throw shooter and I'm a poor three free throw shooter and I take one free throw a day and you take 183. Whatever the gap between us, it's going to keep getting bigger and bigger. So you definitely want your child to read, but if they hate it, you have to use a secondary reinforcer to help them power through their boredom. And settle for books on topics that you find stupid or boring if your kid loves it. Another dinosaur book, that's all you've read for you. But if that's what gets them to read, live with it, as long as it's not way too easy. All right, and have a set time, make it brief, and ask the kid, let the kid choose. All right, now he's older, and it's the, I just read the, um, 
the paragraph and I don't remember anything about it when I get to the 10 questions at the end. I'm going to share this with you and hand this out at the end. It's called the SQ3R system of reading comprehension, survey, question, read, review, recite. And it goes like this. Imagine, all I know is this social studies chapter is called George Washington. I don't know if it's his whole life or just his first term as president, I don't know. So first, the kid has to survey. We find that if you know a little bit about what you're reading, you remember it much better than if you read it cold. So take a minute. Okay, father of our country, chop down the cherry tree is probably not true. First job surveyor, didn't do well in French and Indian War. The Revolution too, tough winter at Valley Forge. Survi surprised the British at Trenton. Beat Cornwallis at Yorktown. First term as president, second term Retirement, freed his slaves, death of Washington. Okay, I'm gonna cover his whole life superficially. Now, question. Read, I'm making this up, the 10 questions at the end. The author is telling you what the 10 most important things they want, she, or he wants you to remember. Nobody can remember everything. And these are the 10 questions you have to answer for homework. Peter Wiley, 4, 14, uh, 4, 10, 14, my heading. Now, quest, um, question, look at the 10 questions at the end. If you can get your kid to be a geek, have them read them out loud. When and where was George Washington born? Let's get some auditory learning going here. What was George Washington's first job? Read the 10 questions. One. George Washington was born in. I put the stem for answer number one. Only now do I three start reading. George Washington is one of our most beloved Americans. He is fondly known as the father of his country. George Washington was born in Colonial Virginia in 1732. Number one is knocked off. What was George's first job? The chop down the cherry, oh, I'm sorry, the George's first job was. The chop down the cherry tree story is probably not true. George's first job was surveyor, surveyor, on and on. You will never again have, Dad, it's not in here. It's just not. Review. Stop every now and then. This is more for teenagers, and summarize what's going on. All right, you know, George Washington was a failure for the first half of his life. He really got his butt whipped at uh, the French and Indian Wars, and they were losing the revolution. And recite. Once again, kids, I'm not, this is geeky. Have him read his answers out loud at the end for long-term memory. George Washington were born in 1732 in Colonial Virginia, was born. You hear your grammatical errors better when you say it out loud and you're getting long-term memory. It's wonderful. It was taught to me when I was a freshman in college. I never read a college textbook like, without doing this again. Almost every ADHD kid says, it'll take longer, I don't want to do it. Pay him to use SQ3R, all right? Use SQ3R, you get to play video games for 15 minutes. Live with it, otherwise you yell at your kid for his entire childhood. I used to be embarrassed about being so crass, and then I tried to help kids without using rewards, and it did not work. Okay, fluency, this is a, a pretty hot thing in reading. Of course, reading is not a race, but you gotta read fast enough that you don't get bored, you don't get exhausted, and you don't forget the first part of the paragraph by the time you uh, get to the end. So the treatment of choice is called repeated reading, where you read the same passage four times trying to go faster each time. You get a stopwatch, 
Uh, Betsy, read this out loud. Hey, nice going, it took you 33 seconds. Now read it again, see if you can beat it. Ah, 31 seconds, try it again. Okay, 31 seconds, you tied one last time. Hey, 29 seconds, and the child learns to read more fluently. This is very boring, so make it a very brief amount of time, and once again, offer rewards for doing hard work that the child would prefer not to do. All right, homework, I'm telling you, for 30 years, I have watched families go through living hell over homework. 30 minutes of homework taken three hours of crying, screaming, and that's just the parent, all right? And the kid is dying. And the parent correctly says, Joey, you're the one who's dragging 30 minutes into three hours. Just get it over with but the soul-crushing boredom, they can't get there. The agony of this has just broken my heart for so long, and so I've tried to come up with the best we can do here to make it happen. The student must accomplish five tasks in order to get credit for homework, and failing at any of these will sink the ship. Number one, he's got to write the assignment down in an organized homework book. Bring the correct book or worksheet home. Do the homework as opposed to blow it off. Take it back to school as opposed to absentmindedly leaving it home. And hand it in, and please don't think the fifth one is a given. It is not. We do all the other four and the kid sits there while every other child hands the homework in and gets a zero. You want to pull your hair out. And it defeats the laziness insult. He did the work. He's not lazy. He forgot to hand. OK. All right. Write the homework down in an organized homework agenda. To start off in September, don't overfunction. See if the child can do this on her own. And you can reward her. If you bring home your book and it's properly filled out, uh, let's say you get to stay up 10 minutes later. If you start without giving me a hard time, you get another 10 minutes. If you get it done within an hour, another 10 minutes, you can earn 30 minutes later bedtime or whatever it is that motivates your child. If she doesn't write it down in an organized homework book, don't wait 10 weeks till you have the first meeting with the teacher. Within three weeks, you know what's going on. See if she can bring the homework book up to the teacher to verify that she wrote it down with a signature. I'm going to be honest. I only do this out of respect for teachers who say, would you please meet me halfway and have the child bring it up to me. This almost never works. As one kid said, if I could remember to bring it up to the teacher, I could remember to write it down. Or, I haven't written it down. Now I'm going to parade up to the teacher and have her say, you didn't write anything. You only bring it up if you already wrote it down. If you didn't write it down, you're trying to hide and get out of the classroom before she can catch you. So give that another two weeks and then face the truth. The teacher has to go to the child and check to see if he wrote it down. But I can't tell you how helpful this is. Every teacher says, I want parents who care, who make their kids do their homework. And all you're asking is, will you make sure I know what the homework is so I can make them do it? I had a teacher friend who worked in middle school and a new principal came to the building. First day, uh, he gave all the teachers a stamp pad and a pad with their signature on it. He said, not just the special ed kids. I know you have five classes, 25 kids in a class, 125. Every single kid is going to put his homework agenda out, and at the last two minutes of each class, you're going to stamp every kid's homework to verify for the parent that this is it. 
she said we were going to have a coup and overthrow the guy. So I saw her a few months later. I said, how's it going with the new principal and the stamp pad? Uh, she said, if you try to take our stamp pads away, we'll have a coup and overthrow you. She said, we thought the parents didn't care. And a small percentage still don't make their kid do the homework. Now we found out it was just the kids weren't writing it down and the parent couldn't make them do it. So helpful. All right, number two, the kid must bring the correct book or worksheet home. Try to have a separate homework folder in whatever he's got. Don't let him put four different assignments in four different uh, um, uh, notebooks. Try to have the homework pocket where the, the, the worksheets go. See if he can do it on his own. Have that be part of his reward system. If he's not doing it within three weeks, you know he's not going to do it. Have him take the backpack to the teacher. Once again, that won't work. You're really going to have to have the teacher look in his backpack. Have a second set of books. This is often part of IEPs. Have a second set of books at home, but only as a safety net. Still make the child bring them back, or otherwise, woohoo! I don't ever have to remember to take my books home. And then pay him a uh, make him pay a tiny rental fee for the book. Joey, you forgot your math book. I do have this here, but set the table as your rent for the book. And, oh, do I get this? Hey, I, I did it in school. I mean, I didn't have to bring it home. We did it in school. I believe you, son, but you're going to have to bring it and f have me check it. Do not believe that. Sometimes it's true, but often it isn't. Do the homework. First, organize uh, the child. evening with a structured homework sheet. Ladies and gentlemen, I try to be a good boy. I am going to show you a sheet from this book, Smart But Scattered. It very specifically says in the frontispiece that the copyright says I cannot hand this out in a workshop like this. I have no connection uh, financially. This is a really good book called Smart But Scattered from Guilford. 16 bucks when I bought it by Peg Dawson, D-A-W-S-O-N, and Richard Guare, G-U-A-R-E. Smart but scattered. If your child is young, make sure you don't get smart but scattered teens, which is their adolescent version of the book. In it is the daily homework sheet in which you sit down with your kid every night when he gets home. The homework book should be filled out correctly because the teacher helped us out. And now you put the subjects, you make sure you got all the materials. You decide whether the child will need parental help. Will mom or dad help me? And now the crucial part, Betsy, make a reasonable guess how long this should take you if you don't take 42 rest breaks. All right, this math sheet, Mom, I think it's going to take 15 minutes. So we start at 4 o'clock. We put, let's shoot for 15 minutes. It's Thursday. We have to study for the spelling test. How long do you think that should take? How about 15 minutes? So do you see, Betsy, rather than be overwhelmed and fall apart and cry, this will only take 30 minutes if you stay on task. The key part is to have the child estimate how long this should take. Then you can put what breaks will I take. I'll give you a 10 minute break between the math sheet and the spelling. And what is my reward? I get to play a board game with dad if I do my homework. This isn't my idea, so I'm not bragging. I've had really good feedback on this because it helps the child realize homework is manageable. The kids tell me, boring, but it helps them. Realize most kids with ADHD bitterly do not want to do their homework. 
they will never want to do their homework. Get over it, all right? I've worked with this for 30 years. Some of the kids do it just fine. Others, I put in six soul crushing hours and now it's three more. Nine, it's only 30 minutes, you drag it out to three hours, but that's how long it takes him. Most of us work eight hours a day. This could be a 10 year old kid working a nine hour day. So infinitely more important than making his bed, infinitely more important than taking the garbage out, reward them for doing their homework. That's their job. It'll take you three minutes to make his bed. It'll take you two minutes to take the garbage out. How much are you gonna fight about that? Make the allowance the best reward you've got Get the homework done. Love it. He got an IEP 504. Shorten the homework. Writing for most kids is the hardest. Let me tell you the difference between reading, spelling, and writing. Reading is just decoding. Dictionary. They put it right there out for me. I just have to decode it. Spelling is a little harder. Dictionary, that's encoding. D-I-C-T-I-O-N, S-I-O-N, yeah, it's a little harder. Creative writing is creation, organization, sequencing, handwriting, spacing, capitals, punctuation, spelling, and grammar. It is a nine-step multitask. It tends to blow the kids I work with away. That's what I want shortened the most. 100 word essay, kid, you write 50. Or write 50 and dictate the last 50 words to your parent. Stop the agony. By the way, when he's crying in hour two to three, do you really think he's learning anything? Yes and no. If you can do a whole sentence, I got this, all right, if I go. Uh, George's uh, performance on the IQ test finished in the 53rd percentile period. Beautiful. If I go, uh, George, um, his poor computer's finished. It's awfully hard for a kid to bark out absolutely complete sentences. So try it, see if it works, but it's tough for a kid to make Dragon work. Oh, love it. It's the future. It's the future. And 80% of ADHD kids have sloppy writing. I love them. I love them. 80% of ADHD kids have sloppy writing. Even if he hunts and pecks pathetically and has to backspace 27 times, once you correct it, you hit print, it's pristine. All right? But 27 cross-outs, it's, it's a mess. Reward them to do their homework. Give them a secondary reinforcer to help them power through their boredom. My favorite is quality time with parents that you love anyway. Get through your homework, we'll play a board game. Take the homework back. Don't overfunction. See if she can do it on her own, but within two weeks, as she finishes each one, I'm sorry, watch her put it in the homework uh, folder pocket. Do not trust her. Watch it go in. Hand the homework in. Don't overfunction. See if he can do it himself within two weeks. Teacher, please watch Joey. Kids, put your homework on the homework tray. Joey, do you have your homework? <gasps> yes. Please, don't get a zero after we did all this work. All right. Is this pie in the sky? Oh, okay, wait a minute. Total time, what I did. Teacher, check to see that he wrote it down and has the correct work, uh, worksheets. One minute. All right, kids, the buses are coming. Joey, Elizabeth, show me your homework. These are my two ADHD kids. 
five to seven percent in a class of 25. You shouldn't have more than two. Every teacher I know claims she has six. Somebody's over-diagnosing here. You should have a couple. All right, Joey, come on, man, you didn't write your spelling down. Elizabeth, beautiful, I can sign it. Joey, you got it, good. Can sign it, Elizabeth, show me your backpack. Come on, you forgot your spelling book, get it in there. Joey, you forgot your math sheet. There it is, put it in, done. It's doable, it's one minute and there is very little a teacher can do to help the parent more. When the child gets home, organize his notebook for that day. Do not let it become a horribly disorganized mess. It won't if you do it daily. Fill out the daily homework planner and look at long-term project calendar, which I'll tell you about in a minute. It's 10 minutes for you. Watch the kid put the homework into the homework folder, one minute for you. Tell the kid to put his homework into the homework tray, one minute for the teacher. Total time for teacher, two minutes. Total time for you, 11 minutes, or you can live in hell with the homework horror. This is doable. All right, have a big calendar for projects, all right? Book report in three weeks. First week, read half the book. Second, read half, uh, second half of the book. Third week, write the book report. Same book, smart but scattered. Long-term project planner. You just Xerox it. Once you buy it, you can Xerox as much as you want. You put the steps of the project in. You put the target date and you check it off. With young children, you will be doing all the work. Don't think a kid can do this, but they internalize it by high school and can run their own projects. Name of this was, how many times do I have to tell you the same thing? So let's now try not to tell him the same thing over and over. Once again, please don't think I'm criticizing you when I say that you shouldn't nag. It's very human, you're only doing it because he's ignoring you, but it is not effective. So, imaginary kid, 14 years old, it's his job to take the garbage out on garbage night to the end of the driveway. Worst way to get him to do it, repetitive nagging. Tommy, take the garbage out. Yeah, in a minute. Tommy, minutes up, take the garbage out. Yeah, when the show's over. Show was over five minutes ago. Take the garbage out. Stop bossing me around. Don't talk to me like that, young. Okay, I mean, we've all been through it. It is not effective. Second best, give one reminder and threaten a punishment, right? In our scenario, Joey is 14, goes to bed at 9.30. Would love to go to bed at 10, would hate to go to bed at nine. Second best way to do it. Remind him once, give him a short amount of time to respond and threaten a punishment. Joey, at 6.45, remember, if you don't take the garbage out by seven, you gotta go to bed at nine o'clock tonight. Wow, mom, thanks for reminding me, I did forget. Thanks for not making me jump. And I don't like that you're threatening me with the punishment, but I do wanna avoid it. So I'll take the garbage out. Better than nagging. Best, one reminder, give him a little time and offer him a reward. Joey, it's 6.45. Remember, if you take the garbage out by seven, you get to stay up till 10. Whew, thanks for reminding me, because I had forgotten. Thanks for not making me jump, and I'd really like to stay up till 10. Not everything in life will lend itself to this little paradigm, but chores always will. Write your homework down. Prove that to me when you get home. Start at four o'clock 
and finish, and we'll estimate each night it'll be different within an hour, 45 minutes. Do those three things, and you get 25 cents for each job, 10 minutes later bedtime, uh, 10 minutes of soccer practice in the backyard with dad, whatever. One reminder, give them a little time to respond, offer a reward, do it thousands of times during his childhood. And then response cost, uh, this is one of my favorite behavioral interventions, I love this, and it's so easy you got to have a reward that the kid really wants to win. That is the make or break principle. So now, let us say that your child is using curse words. And you would want him to have the self-control to not blurt out curse words. And he was like me as a kid. He desperately wanted to stay up a half an hour later. Charlie, I grant you 30 minutes later bedtime. Every time you say a curse word, I go to this thing on the refrigerator and you lose 10 minutes. You just said a curse word, you're down to 20. What the, you're down to 10. Guys, I'm sick of your fist fighting, your brothers. I got some money so I can afford this because I know that you love money. You both start with a buck. Every time you have a fight, I could not care less who started it. You lose money and I just tick you down. If they love money, it'll be powerful. If they love bedtime, it'll be powerful. Whatever it is that turns your kid on and is acceptable to you, it may be too much money. It would be 730 bucks a year if they were perf both boys were perfect. Although most parents don't have to worry about a full payout. Um, bedtime was what I loved. All right, so let's review take home concepts. Executive functioning is stop and think. It is run your life in a way that pays off by not going for the immediate impulse, but stopping that impulse and thinking up something better. Short attention span really means an inability to sustain motivation and effort in a subjectively boring situation which ADHD people feel much more deeply than we do, so you gotta use secondary reinforcers to help them power through their boredom. Lack of mindfulness, what they, they got it in their memory, but it doesn't come to mind when they need it, which is a big part of their biggest problem, impulsive behavior. They act before they, they think. You must use structure and reinforcers to help them have self-control because the bottom line of ADHD is that it is self-control disorder. And then please use the specifics that I've taught you today. If you want what I consider the best book on ADHD, get Russell Barclay's Taking Charge of ADHD, now in its third edition, paperback from Guilford, 20 bucks. Uh, this guy really knows what he's talking about. I want to thank you for coming out on this beautiful evening. Uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it, so thank you very much. Good night.